The main character, whose face was half hidden by a mask, stood looking forward, and suddenly heard someone say that Kuro, the master of the guild of adventurers called Nightmare, had saved this man. A girl standing nearby said that Kuro is very kind. Next to her stood another girl, who enthusiastically added that he saved her life too. Behind them, Yumuruma raised her hands in the air and exclaimed that she loved him too. The guy, smiling, added that Kuro deserves his devotion, and the other guy, clenching his hand into a fist, decisively said that there is no one better than Kuro. Crow continued to stand, listening to this in bewilderment, and suddenly another girl said that Yoshinai Crow was the greatest guild master in the world. Everyone else agreed with this girl, but Kuro, unable to bear it, grabbed his head with his hands and in despair asked them to stop. Some time later, Crow was sitting in a spacious room, holding a newspaper in his hands. He read the title of the article, which announced that the guild called Nightmare had returned again. Kuro looked thoughtfully at the page where this was written, and then opened the next part of the article, in which the author urged readers to closely monitor the popularity of the very attractive Nightmare Adventurers Guild. Kuro pursed his lips tightly as he continued to read excerpts from the written text. The townspeople thought it was funny how different their faces were. A tavern worker wrote that Rurashira was so beautiful that you could see the halo above her head, and a trade supplier called Yumuruma a real angel. In addition, the words of a priestess from another guild were cited, who said that Horus is beautiful not only in face, but also noted that his fans are very polite. In addition, one of the teenage students wrote that the guy in the mask was definitely handsome too. The girl, who at that moment was also in the room making coffee, suddenly heard someone sigh and turned around in surprise, calling out to Crow. Crow sat with his hands on his head, and the girl, coming closer, asked if something was bothering him. She placed a tray with a cup of coffee on the table next to Kuro and announced to Kuro that it was his drink. Kuro assumed that the answer to the girl's question was yes, and she offered to discuss it with her, his maid, if that was the case. It was Furu Suruzu, a member of Team Nightmare, ranked 4th rank. Furu said that she would do anything for Kuro, and Kuro, calling Furu's name, asked what she would do if he purely hypothetically said that he would leave the guild. Kuro froze in shock when she heard this question, and realized with horror that he meant that he would leave them. Confirming Furu's assumption, Kuro asked what she would say. She thought about it and finally said, if Kuro had done something like that, then she would have died. A small knife appeared in Furu's hands, which she, closing her eyes, put to her neck, and Kuro, seeing this, even spat out the coffee that he had previously managed to sip. He told Furu not to do this and asked her to value her life and put the knife away. Furu did as Kuro asked, but said that she could not do anything because her life belonged to him, and if he did not need her, then she must die. Kuro asked indignantly, why would that be? Taking a cup of coffee in his hands, he thought that he did not want to take other people's lives, and suddenly a girl ran up and tugged Crow by the sleeve of his jacket several times. Crow looked at her in surprise, asking Yumaram, what is it? Yumuruma Fugara, who had the first rank and is part of the Nightmare Guild, asked if Kuro was really leaving the guild. Tears welled up in her eyes, and Kuro replied that he was only doing this hypothetically. Yumuruma cried and exclaimed, even if it's hypothetical, she doesn't want Kuro to leave. She hugged Kuro, repeating again that she didn't want this. Kuro was surprised by this behavior and looked at Yumuruma in bewilderment, and she continued to repeat over and over again that she did not want him to leave. Yumuruma shook her head capriciously, and Kuro, who was touched by her hair, exclaimed in displeasure that her hair hurt. In the end, he said that it was his fault and promised that he would not joke like that again. Having calmed down a little, Yumuruma asked if it was true. Kuro exclaimed that it was true, and Yumuruma, touching Kuro's face with her hands, said that there should be no lying and leaving like her dad did. Kuro did not answer, looking a little scared at Yumuruma, and Furu, smiling, noted that Yumuruma likes to play around. Kuro was not sure that this problem should be ignored and perceived as self-indulgence, but he smiled and, placing his hand on the head of Yumuruma, who continued to hug him, thought that next time they might understand when he was speaking seriously and not jokes. He said out loud that the others should not worry about what he had said, and again repeated that it was just a joke. Turning his gaze to his watch, Kuro asked the others to look at the time and, noting that everything was in place, he decided that the meeting could begin and addressed Rurashira. Rurashira, straightening her hair, said that she understood everything and decided that she would start then. 
Ruashir Naitsu was part of the Nightmare Guild and had the second rank. Holding several sheets of paper in her hands, she announced that a dungeon quest was on the agenda today. The other adventurers, who were also sitting on couches or chairs in the room, prepared to participate in the meeting. Rank 3 Rofia Furedo asked boredly, is this really about that goblin nest from the rumors? She suggested that there might be something else, and at that moment Aramaria Roisu, who has the third rank, exclaimed that goblins are dirty and stink, and are also enemies of women. Gurga, who is a rank 8 adventurer, chuckled and asked, isn't this a minor opponent? He smugly noted that this was not his level at all, and Ruroshira said that they learned that the goblins had collected a large number of useful items. Kuro listened carefully to what Ruashira was saying, resting his chin on his hands, which he placed with his elbows on the table, and especially focused on Ruroshira's words about objects. He presented weapons, coins, jewelry, equipment, and eventually raised his hand, announcing to Ruroshira that he was in business. Ruroshira thanked Crow for this, and after that, saying that Crow was coming, she asked who else. Everyone in the room immediately raised their hands up, expressing their desire to go on this mission. Almost all of the guild members were girls, and some of them smiled enthusiastically, while others simply looked at Rurashira seriously. Kuro, thoughtful, mentally noted that he could deal with the goblins alone, asking himself, were they really that worried about him? He was suddenly distracted from his thoughts, noticing how a guy appeared next to his table, kneeling down on one knee in a bow. It was Horusu, also a member of the Nightmare Guild, who had the 8th rank, the same as Goroga. Horus asked that Kuro take only him on the quest, promising that his loyalty would definitely give Kuro strength. Kuro, putting his palm forward, objected that he could handle it alone, but at that moment someone exclaimed displeasedly that it was unfair. Guruga said that he would go with Crow because he deserves more to have us by his side. Horusu smiled and asked Guruga not to be a fool, because it didn't matter what he thought about it, because Horusu still deserved to be with Crow the most. Horus also added that Garga would say why this was so, and Kuro, looking nervously at what was happening, awkwardly asked what about his opinion. However, no one paid attention to him, and Horus, folding his hands on his chest, said smugly that it was obvious that the young master, who was Crow, himself wanted Horus to go with him. Garga chuckled and asked if Kuro didn't want it to be him. Garga and Horus were confident that they could protect Crow from anything, but each asked the other to prove it. Kuro took a cup of coffee and, raising it to his lips, mentally asked them to stop. And suddenly Horusu and Garga found themselves engulfed in fire and screamed in horror that their bodies were burning. Out of surprise, Kuro even spat out the coffee he had managed to sip from the cup, and Garga and Horus fell to the floor. Smoke rose from them, and everyone realized that it was fire. A staff was pointed at Garga and Horusa, at the end of which was a jewel inserted, and on both sides of it were decorations resembling petals. A swirl of flame appeared in the air near the staff, and someone said that they were too noisy, ordering them to stop arguing. Sixth rank Arisha Kurisu calmly said that they should receive punishment. Kuro thanked Arish for stopping them despite the way it was done. Arisha smiled and, leaving the staff aside, asked Kuro to praise her for helping him. Crow asked again in surprise, but after that he came closer to Arisha and, placing his palm on her head, called her a good girl. Arisha closed her eyes contentedly and admitted that she liked it when he did this. One of the girls, hearing this, was horrified, the other narrowed her eyes a little, and Furu began pouring coffee into a cup with a suspicious look. Kuro asked if it was true. He finally agreed with Arisha's words, and Rurashira, hearing this, opened her eyes wide, shocked by this. Arisha, meanwhile, said that this is why she will become Crow's wife, and he said that this is also true, but suddenly realized what he had said, and, putting his hands forward, did not agree with Arisha's proposal, explaining that it would be difficult for her if she will become his wife. Arisha promised that she would accept everything about him, and after that she took two cherries from the plate and, bringing them to her mouth, stuck out her tongue and added that she would also accept all his passions and desires. Someone trembled with anger, clutching a pencil in his hand, and Kuro awkwardly suggested that they deal with this when the time comes. Arisha replied that the marriage had been agreed upon, and at that moment someone raised their hand, asking if she could also take this place. Theodore asked Rofia if she really wanted to go on the quest too. However, she replied with a wink that this was not so, but added that she also wanted to talk about it. Kuro was very surprised, and Rofia ran up to him and hugged him. 
Hiro's eyes widened and Rurashura clenched her fist so hard that the pencil she was holding in it cracked and broke. Rofia, meanwhile, said that she also wanted to be Kuro's wife and pressed herself even closer to him. She added that she agreed to take the place of the second wife, but Crow said that he did not want any adultery. Rofia countered that it was normal in a polyamorous relationship, but Kuro asked what was wrong with that. They wanted to answer him something, but suddenly someone hit the table with their palm, shouting that they did not approve of this. It was Rurashira who was bent over with her hand on the table. Crow, looking at her condition, called out to Rurashira in surprise, and at that moment she, covering her mouth with her hand, desperately said that she could not believe that Crow would become such a lustful animal. Kuro exclaimed that he wouldn't do that. They eventually decided to continue recruiting members, and Kuro had to stay in his room until then. Crow thoughtfully walked along the corridor, and opening the door to the desired room, entered and sat on the floor, leaning his back against the wall. He sadly lowered his head, thinking that he really wanted to leave the guild. Yoshinai Crow had the lowest tenth rank, and was also a member of the guild called Nightmare. He sadly noted that although he is a leader, he is still pathetic. Kuro couldn't believe that they were all talking so well about him, and rising to his feet, he assumed that it was natural. He was the weakest and couldn't even use the deception skill that the goddess gave him. However, that was not all, and Kuro, going to the small mirror standing on the chest of drawers, thought about another reason why he wanted to leave the guild. Kuro took off his mask, looking sadly at his unremarkable eyes reflected in the mirror, as well as at his freckled nose. As he continued to look at his reflection, he noted that he had an unlucky and frustrating face. It is because of this complex that he always hides his face under a mask, so even his comrades did not see his face. Kuro thought that it was like a group of beautiful people that he didn't fit in with at all. He mentally imagined all his comrades who were distinguished by their special beauty, and noted that he had no talent, no confidence, and he could not even show his comrades his real appearance. Continuing to clutch the mask in his hands, Kuro asked himself if he was really fit to be the master of the greatest guild. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, and someone asked if it was possible to come in. Kuro hastily put the mask on his face and, stuttering a little in surprise, allowed the knocking man to enter. It was Aramaria who exclaimed joyfully that she had been chosen. Smiling and winking at Kuro, she said that the very beautiful Aramaria was here, and they would go on a date called a quest. Looking up, Kuro said wearily that it was just her. Aramaria asked displeasedly, what kind of reaction is this? She closed her eyes, clenched her hand into a fist, and shouted that Kuro was treating her badly. Kuro asked if she really thought so. Aramaria replied that this was true, but Kuro admitted that he thought they were close. Aramaria's irritation disappeared, and she, looking at Crow in surprise, asked if this means that she is special to him. Kuro began to walk down the corridor to the place he needed, assuming that this was the case, but added that she was special to him as a friend of his own age. Aramaria became very sad and continued to follow Crow, lowering her hands in resignation and bowing her head. She noted that they were both 16 years old, and Kuro suddenly stopped when he saw a girl downstairs sitting alone at a table and drinking a drink from a neat cup. It was Rafia Furedo, a rank 5 member of Team Nightmare. She sat quietly, not noticing Aramaria and Crow. Kuro asked if only Aramaria would go with him. After asking again, Aramaria confirmed this, and after that the two of them began to go down the stairs. Kuro called out to Rafia, and when she heard this, she shuddered in surprise and looked at Kuro in fear, saying his name. Rafia awkwardly apologized for the behavior of her sister, who was Rofia. Kuro also remembered how Rofia acted recently, but asked Rafia not to worry, noting that Rofia always behaved like this. He suddenly remembered something and turned to Rafia again, and she asked in surprise what was it. Kuro asked if she wanted to go to the dungeon with him. Rafia did not answer immediately, and Aramaria, hearing Crow's proposal, was horrified, thinking that this was a date with two people. Finally, Rafia asked why her. Kuro explained that she also raised her hand, but did not say anything, and Rafia said with emotion that he noticed it. Kuro replied that Rafia was also a friend of his age, and she upsetly asked for forgiveness for thinking so arrogantly about herself, although she is just someone very insignificant. Kuro exclaimed that her self-depreciation had gone too far, and Rafia tried to justify herself, but Kuro asked if things wouldn't have been so hopeless if the reliable Rafia had gone with them. 
Kuro admitted that he had hoped that Rafia would come with them, and placing his fingers on his forehead, asked if he had made a mistake. However, Rafia, embarrassed, covered her mouth with her hands and exclaimed that she would gladly join them. Aramaria looked a little displeased at the smiling Rafia, and Crow said that Aramaria, Rafia, and the three of him were heading to the dungeon. Having announced this, he joyfully raised his hand up. Some time later in the guild, everyone was minding their own business, but did not say anything. Someone suddenly asked if Crow was going to leave here. It was Yumaruma, who was sitting on the sofa with her knees pressed to her chest. She was very upset, and Ruoshira, Rofia, Arisha, and Furu, hearing Yumaruma's words, looked at her in fear. Ruoshira shouted Yumaruma's name, and Arisha said that there was no need to worry, because Kuro would marry her, and then Yumaruma would become their adopted daughter. Arisha sat down on the sofa next to Yumaruma and hugged her, patting her on the head and noting that they were all here, so they would solve this together. Someone was very happy, and Ruoshira, tiredly pressing her fingers to her forehead, said that they could not do anything, since Crow had his own intentions. Furu walked closer to them, holding a tray with cups of drink in her hands, and admitted that she was glad that Kuro was interested in something on this quest, although she was curious about what exactly he was interested in. Rofia exclaimed that Arisha would drive her crazy, and Horus, approaching them, said that Rofia would do it too. Rofia turned around in surprise, and Horus said seriously that he wanted them to refrain from leading Crow down the path of obscenity. He adjusted the gloves on his hands, and Rofia repeated his words and said that it was impossible, asking if it was not so. She added that at the end of the day, everyone in the guild adores Kuro. Looking at everyone else who was now in the guild room, Rofia fell silent in embarrassment, putting her fingers to her lips, and Gurga asked in bewilderment, what's wrong with the one who likes Kuro? He asked, is this bad? He was told that this was something he could not understand, and therefore he was ordered to remain silent. Guga, offended by these words, fell to his knees, and Yumuruma walked up to him and sat down on his knees next to him, stroking Garga's head comfortingly. One of the adventurers said that, in any case, Kuro said that he was joking, and therefore ordered everyone to stop discussing it. This man, being Crow's deputy, announced that he would not allow it to be discussed, and asked if everyone understood. Ruroshira, holding a cup in her hands, looked sadly to the side and, mentally turning to Crow, said that he was very strange. She came closer to the window and thought that they all appreciated it. Touching the glass with her fingers, Ruroshira admitted to herself that she did not understand why he did not notice their feelings, and remembered how someone shouted that someone ugly should not come closer. A picture appeared in Ruroshira's thoughts where a lonely girl was sitting on the ground and people walked around her, disgustedly asking what was wrong with her. Someone explained that there was one case recently, and this was a girl from a noble family, all of whose members had recently been killed. People were willing to bet that someone had been against this family for a long time, and some of the aristocrats liked what was happening. The girl, who was actually little Ruroshira, began to cry, but suddenly Kuro approached her, who turned out to be the only one who extended his hand to the girl who had lost all faith and hope in this world. Crow that day, smiling, really extended his hand to the woman crying loudly on the Ruoshira street, and she took his hand with her palm, accepting help. Now Ruoshira thought that Crow had already done this nine times, and for them, people abandoned by this world, he is a ray of hope. That is why this story talks about Kuro, who was the self-proclaimed ugly master of the guild. Crow, Rafia and Aramaria meanwhile walked towards the place to fight the goblins, and Ruroshira said that she would never let Crow go, no matter what the cost. There's a fine line between love and madness, and it's also a story about nine guild members who idolized their leader. Finally, when it was already dark and the stars and moon appeared in the sky, in an abandoned building, Crow, Aramaria, and Rafia approached a group of goblins, stopping at some distance from the monsters. They carefully examined the opponents, who smiled predatorily, and Aramaria asked Crow to look at her. Crow at first asked again in surprise, but after that he agreed with Aramaria's proposal, and she, running forward, waved her weapon and cut the group of goblins standing in front of them into several parts, cutting off the monster's heads, arms, and legs. The two goblins who survived froze in fear, looking at the splashes of blood, and Aramaria, smiling madly, told them to see her greatness. Kiro pointed in the direction where the remaining goblins had fled and told Rafia and Aramaria about it. Aramaria screamed in disappointment, but suddenly calmed down when she heard a strange noise that came a little in the distance. 
She and Crow looked in surprise in the direction where the sounds were coming from and saw Raffia, who smiled and told them that everything was fine. Her cheek was stained with blood and, in addition, blood was dripping from the blade of Raffia's sword. Kuro thanked Raffia, noting that she was very helpful, and looked at the pipes of the goblins who had escaped earlier. Raffia asked that this be given to her and promised that she would destroy all the scum, because she is good at it. Kuro looked at Raffia in silence for a while, smiling awkwardly, and then said that he really assumed that was the case, and thanked Raffni again. He suddenly noticed that Aramaria was looking at him very strangely and asked what was wrong. Aramaria asked if she did a good job. Theodore confirmed this, and Aramaria displeasedly asked why he hadn't praised her yet. She leaned closer to Kuro and, with wide eyes, asked if he was always like this. Aramaria noted that he treats her as if she is some kind of joke and always laughs at her. Kuro wanted to say that she also did a good job, but Aramaria suddenly interrupted his words and asked him to hit her. Crow asked again in bewilderment, and Aramaria, closing her eyes, exclaimed that simple words would not console her, and therefore asked to pat her on the head. Theodore awkwardly asked why she was so unstable. He didn't want to fulfill Aramaria's request, but at that moment Raffia, raising her hand, asked if she could too. Theodore asked displeasedly if they understood that they were now underground. He didn't know if this was normal, but in the end he decided that he would pat them on the head if they wanted it. Crow extended his palms to the heads of Raffia and Aramaria, standing next to each other, who looked at Crow with confusion and expectancy. And suddenly, when Crow had almost touched Aramaria and Raffia with his hands, a scream was heard behind them. Raffia exclaimed that this was impossible, and Aramaria added that this was a woman's cry. They angrily asked why this was happening now. Crow ran in the direction where the scream was coming from, and was surprised to see a girl in a cloak running towards him, throwing her hood over her head. She asked for help in horror and, running up to Kuro, explained that goblins had attacked her. The girl said that even her comrades were attacked, and Kuro, holding his palms in front of the girl's face, said that everything was fine and asked her to calm down. He said that he was here on a guild quest, and, repeating that everything was fine, promised that he would take her to the city. The girl took Kuro's hand and asked if it was true. She thanked Kuro, and he, confirming that this was true, said that he had two more reliable comrades with him. The girl took off her hood and was very happy about Crow's words, asking if this meant that she was saved. Tears flowed down her cheeks, and Kuro confirmed the unfamiliar girl's assumption. But at that moment, Aramaria ran past him, who, having activated the Holy Gungir spear, attacked the girl, causing blood to splash in different directions. Crow froze with a dumbfounded smile on his lips, and Aramaria looked with a mad look at the girl she had wounded and angrily told her not to touch Crow with her dirty hands. She put her weapon away a little, and the girl, kneeling, asked why this was so. Aramaria asked if she really thought they would help her. She asked, isn't this complete nonsense? Aramaria was very angry that this girl interrupted her and Kuro's wonderful moments, and the girl, with blood flowing down her chin from her mouth, asked in horror what Aramaria was talking about. Aramaria, without answering, swung her weapon again, and the girl shook in fear. But at that moment, Crow asked Aramaria to stop. Aramaria obeyed and, turning around, looked in surprise at Kuro, who recalled that he had said that you couldn't kill everyone, because they were adventurers, not killers. The girl, frightened by the blade of Aramaria's weapon, practically lay down on the floor, trying to move away, and looked in horror at Crow, who apologized, admitting that he had pretended not to notice her deception in order to resolve everything peacefully. He asked if she really hunted other adventurers like that too. Taking out a sheet of paper with a picture of a girl, Kuro said that this was the Goblin Tamer, a member of the Dark Guild Wild Hunter. Tamer asked if he had really deceived her. She got angry and called Kuro names, and after that, throwing off her cloak, she poured a potion from a small glass flask into her mouth. Crow realized what kind of potion it was, and together with Aramaria, he looked seriously in front of him. Tamer, grinning evilly, asked, so what if they exposed her? She noted that this did not affect anything, and a large number of goblins appeared behind her. Theodore was surprised by such a huge quantity, and Aramaria exclaimed in disgust that it was disgusting. Tamer advised them to simply give up, because here she had hundreds of groups of goblins under her control. She announced that she would kill them and take their valuables, and their bodies would become fertilizer. The goblins stood ready to fight, 
and at that moment, Rafia activated her dual Holy Swords Excalibur and ran towards the goblins, swinging two blades. She cut the monsters into pieces, and Tamer looked doomedly at the splashes of blood rising into the air. Rafia calmly said that this was absolutely disgusting, and after that she wished the next monster to die. Tamer called Rafia just another little girl and, stretching her arms forward, told the goblins not to be afraid. The goblins obeyed the order and ran to attack, and at that moment Aramaria activated the Gungir, ordering it to pass through the monsters. Aramaria's weapon obeyed the spell, and the sharp blade, reaching the goblins, passed through it, cutting off parts of the Tamer watched in horror at the destruction of her subordinates, and when the weapon Aramaria turned to her again, asking what it was. She didn't understand why this was happening, since the goblins had killed many adventurers, so she asked how they managed to defeat her strongest goblins. Aramaria said nothing, and Tamer looked at her weapon, as well as Rafia's weapon, dumbfoundedly saying that these are Excalibur and Gungir, which are the highest rank weapons of the mythical class. Aramaria and Rafia just looked at Tamer calmly, and she asked in shock, how could ordinary adventurers like them get such weapons? Crow, crossing his arms over his chest, admitted that he was the person who created this, and Tamer, turning her gaze to him, said that this was impossible. Sweat was dripping down her face, and Kiro remembered that a special creation skill was given to him by the goddess after death, and this allows him to turn any idea into reality. With knowledge from games and manga, Crow could create the rarest artifacts in this world. Tamer asked what kind of ability this is. Looking at her hands, she noted that this was even more dishonest than her goblins, and Kuro decisively said that this was why Tamer had better give up. He extended his hand forward, activating the creation, and Tamer called him names, asking what powerful weapon he would use this time. When the creation process was completed, a black sword appeared in Crow's hand, and Tamer, asking for the name, looked at the blade and fearfully noted that the weapon fully corresponded to the name. Tamer took a closer look at the weapon again, noticing brightly shining waves of magical energy next to it. However, near the black sword this glow was not so bright, and Tamer, concentrating on the aura of this weapon, grinned and said that she knew that Crow had a weakness. Pointing her finger at Kuro, she mockingly asked if that was true. Tamer exclaimed, although he can create powerful weapons, he is not able to use it, and realized that this is why his friends are fighting, and he himself has this insignificant sword. Tema remembered how Aramaria and Rafia fought and grinned, while Rafia and Aramaria silently looked at each other. Tema ordered the goblins to run towards Kuro and destroy him, and the monsters obeyed, heading towards Kuro. However, Kuro swung his black sword, and a line of shadow appeared around it. The monster scattered, cut into pieces and engulfed in magical flames, and Theodore, not paying attention to the look of horror on Tamer's face, suggested that his weapon might be a little outdated, noting that it was even undoubtedly outdated, but added that even so, if it's a simple battle with goblins, then he can't lose. As he said this, Kuro looked at the small scratch that appeared on his cheek, and Tamer, meanwhile, clenched her teeth in horror, and then turned around and began to run away shouting to the surviving goblins that they were retreating, since there was no point in messing with them. But Tamer did not have time to run far, as Aramaria and Rafia, running past her, cut off both Tamer's Tamer screamed in pain, calling the adventurer's names, and falling to her knees, desperately asked what she had done to them. Kuro recalled what they told her about the reason, explaining that she was hunting adventurers, but Aramaria and Rafia thought a little differently. They, looking madly at Tamer, said that she had humiliated Crow and injured him. Tamer, looking at Crow, asked if they really meant him. Rafia and Aramaria asked if they could kill Tamer. Kuro annoyedly reminded them that he had already said that killing was wrong, and Aramaria and Rafia asked if everything would be fine until they killed her, since that was the case. Kuro asked again in bewilderment, and his subordinates suggested that they were great. Tamer, listening to this conversation, began to cry, desperately asking for forgiveness, but soon after that the sounds of blows and cries of pain were heard. Blood splashed, and Rafia said that Crow saved him and his sister because of his father's cruelty, so he is a noble man who accepted her so stupid and insignificant. She asked how Tamer dares to insult such a noble man. Rafia ordered Tamer to quickly express her regret, and Aramaria added that Kuro was the prince who opened her eyes to the fact that the man who insulted and beat her was taking advantage of her, and promised that because of Kuro's request, she would not kill Tamer, 
but even so he won't forgive her for his humiliation. She told Tamer to thank Crow by saying thank you as many times as she could. Kuro watched awkwardly as Rafia and Aramaria continued to attack Tamer, who was crying in pain. Some time later, Aramaria smiled and admitted that she felt very good after stabbing her. Rafia laughed and agreed, noting that they were teaching that girl a lesson for insulting Kuro. From the dungeon they took with them a bloody bag in which someone was making indistinct sounds. Kuro walked a little behind and, looking at the bag that Rafia was dragging along the floor, thought that they completed this quest without incident, but admitted to himself that, as he thought, there was a problem, which was him. Kuro was the only casualty in this quest, and as he touched the cut on his cheek with his fingers, he noted that he was their weak link, asking himself whether it was worth leaving everything as it was. Crow did not have time to think about the second scenario, because at that moment Aramaria and Rafia turned to him and, stretching out their blood-stained hands to him, smiled and offered to go. Kuro did not answer anything and smiled a little nervously, but still took Rafia and Aramaria by the hands and walked out of the dungeon with them, mentally noting that he knew that it would be better for him to leave the guild. Crow's agony continued. Some time later, at the Guild Federation in the branch on the western border, someone said displeasedly that Kuro had done it again. Branchmaster Zoys walked slightly ahead of Kuro and asked them to put themselves in their shoes for once because they had to deal with all the consequences. Crow thoughtfully took his chin with his hand and asked if he had really done something. Zoys explained that he was talking about the goblin trainer that Kuro had captured. Now she had PTSD, and Tamer sat there, trembling and with her head down, muttering about how she had caused trouble for everyone and thanking her for showing her the right path. Zoys exclaimed that Kuro had overdone it as always, and Kuro, thinking that it wasn't him, awkwardly asked for forgiveness. Continuing to walk, he asked if Zoys really called him here because of this. Zoys said that this was why he called too, but first he turned around and asked why Furu and Rurashira were also here. Furu and Rurashira were indeed close to Kuro, standing behind him, and Rurashira explained that she was Kuro's bodyguard and therefore had to protect him, and Furu added that she was Kuro's maid and should be by his side. Zoys did not argue, saying that he had a request for Kuro personally. He stopped in front of large decorated doors and, holding the doorknob, invited them to go. The man, who was sitting in the room with one leg crossed over the other, asked Zoys displeasedly, why so long? He noted that the tea in the cup he was holding was already cold, and Zoys asked Viscount Rai for forgiveness for the wait. He announced that he had brought Crow from the nightmare, and then introduced Paradise to Crow, explaining that he was the customer. Rai took a sip of tea, and Crow, thinking, realized that Rai was an aristocrat and asked how important he was. Rai was surprised by this question, and Zoys explained that Viscount Rai is in fact the ruler of the land entrusted to him by the Count. He added, to put it another way, he is very important, and said that the Crow Guild is located in the territory of Paradise. Rai, calling out to Zoys, asked if it was normal that Crow did not know how the world worked. Zoys simply replied that he was confident in Kuro's strength, and Rai told Kuro to sit down. Kuro complied with the request and sat down opposite him on the sofa, mentally noting that he was a little awkward. Rai seriously said that he had a task for Kuro, explaining that it was to search for a missing person. Furu and Ruashira leaned a little closer to Kuro and said that they were refusing, and Kuro displeasedly noted that they didn't even listen. He felt sad because he thought that he seemed to be solving nothing, and Ruashira noted that searching for a missing person was too strange. She asked if this was not the jurisdiction of knights and soldiers, not adventurers. Rurashira twirled a strand of hair around her finger and added eerily that she could not let Crow go on such a suspicious mission. Furu seriously added that Rai clearly arranged the meeting here behind closed doors for a reason, asking if there was any reason why he decided to hide. Rai was stunned by this behavior, and Zoys tiredly covered his face with his hand. Having overcome his surprise, Rai indignantly asked Zoys why they were so rude. He reminded him that he was a Viscount, and Zoys, calling Kuro, exclaimed that he was the leader, and asked why then his subordinates spoke instead of him. Crow asked in bewilderment if he was really to blame. He noted that he did nothing at all, and Zoys and Rai, pointing their fingers at Kuro and his team, ordered the adventurers to know their place. Rai noted that if he wanted, he could crush their guild at any moment, and Kuro awkwardly asked to wait and stop pushing. He said if Rai doesn't want to get hurt, then it's better for him not to say such things. Rai wanted to object, 
but did not have time, because Zoys, looking at the sheets of paper that he was holding in his hands, said that where they had to go, the knights and soldiers would not be able to do anything. Ruroshira asked what kind of place is this? Zoys did not answer right away, but eventually said that this is a country of succubi, mentally imagining a huge palace with high towers on which flags hung. Some time later, Ruroshira sat on a chair, crossing one leg over the other and studying what was written on the sheets of paper that she held in her hands and said thoughtfully about the land of succubi. She said that in fact it was an independent city and not a full-fledged country, explaining that there was a merchant guild there that belonged to Rai. Ruroshira also added that 40 people from the Daven company had disappeared. Repeating Ruroshira's words about an independent city, Aramaria asked what Rai was doing in this city. Harusu assumed that he wanted to avoid the knowledge that he was personally involved with the Debong company and asked if they should take the job. Guruga placed his hands on the table and, lowering his head to it, admitted that he was performing poorly in investigations and therefore offered to refuse. Arisha said that she heard that this city was formed by a man who married a succubus and then the city grew due to the fact that succubi were accepted there with open arms. Crow noted, to put it bluntly, the whole city is a huge brothel. Roshira laughed, covering her mouth. Rofia and Rafia were horrified. Aramaria covered Yumuruma's ears, looking displeased at Crow, and Furu froze nervously. After everyone's shock wore off, everyone started shouting that Kuro couldn't go to such a place because it was too dangerous for him. Yumuruma suddenly said that she wanted to go, but they objected to her, exclaiming that she would not go anywhere. After this, the guild members returned to the discussion of Kuro, noting that he was still young and could do something stupid, and then they would have only one option, namely, racial genocide. Frowning determinedly, they imagined a powerful explosion, promising that they would wipe out the succubi from the face of the earth. Crow asked in bewilderment, and asked if they were really joking. Rofia suggested refusing the task, and Furu admitted that she agreed with her, because this was too suspicious a request. Horace said that succubi are simply terrible creatures that cannot be communicated with, and Crow, turning to Ruroshira, asked if she was also against it. Ruroshira confirmed that she was against it, noting that succubi and the people who interact with them are simply disgusting. Crow understood everything, but she thought displeasedly that she couldn't simply ignore possible victims and couldn't leave people to their own devices. He picked up several sheets of paper that were previously lying on his desk and read that the land of Succubi is a popular tourist destination due to its unique culture, which includes cuisine, clothing, and much more. Crow added that the country of Succubi is also called the City of Beauty because good cosmetics are sold there. He did not have time to finish reading everything that was written as Rurashira, turning to the rest of the guild members, raised her hand up and exclaimed that they were all going to the land of Succubi. Turning to Kuro, she asked him not to be afraid, promising that she would protect him. Crow awkwardly thanked Ruroshira and Arisha, who had already packed her suitcase, put on a Panama hat, a necklace of flowers and sunglasses, asked when they were leaving. Yumuruma exclaimed that she was going too, and Kuro awkwardly replied that they actually had to complete the task. Furu agreed to this, saying that she would have to devote a little time to the task, and Kuro reminded that this was the main reason for the trip. Ruashira said that she would also go, and Aramaria, agreeing, exclaimed that she could not just leave the missing people to die. Garuga said if everyone is going, then he is going too, but his words were received negatively. Aramaria called Garuga, Ruashira indignantly added that he has no trust, and Rofia asked what he was even thinking about. Garuga did not understand what caused this reaction and asked why this was. The girls continued to talk about how they despised him and were sick of him, noting that it was disgusting. Kuro, listening to all this, smiled nervously and thought that sometimes they all scare him. A little later, a carriage was driving along the road, and some time later, Kuro, stopping on the street, sighed and announced that this was a country of succubi. There were a lot of people on the streets, minding their own business. Furu suddenly remembered that Garuga and Horus were very upset. Kuro agreed with this, but added that the guild couldn't be left empty for long, so the two of them had to be left to handle the paperwork. Ruroshira suggested splitting up and starting an investigation, deciding to divide into groups by lot. She put forward her fist, in which she was clutching several ribbons, and touching the earring on her ear with her fingers, she added that they would not lose the earrings so that they could contact at any time. 
All this time, they were being watched by a girl with horns and a tail, who, with a hood over her head, carefully looked out from around the corner. A little later, someone confirmed that a group of adventurers had entered the city, suggesting that Paradise had sent them. The girl, sitting on one knee in front of the throne, asked if she should get rid of them. However, the man sitting on the throne refused this offer, noting that they had come to this city, which meant they were guests. However, this person added that if the girl can prove their direct connection with the company, then she can do it. The girl said that she understood everything. This place was a paradise for succubi, and they were not going to forgive those who dare threaten their paradise. The girl sitting on the throne, throwing one leg over the other, said that these were precisely the words of the queen of the country of succubi, Yarama Kapak the 19th. She smiled bloodthirstily, and the girl exclaimed that everything would be as Yarama wished. A little later, Rofia, having chewed a piece of food that she had taken into her mouth before, said blissfully that it was very tasty. She noted that the oyster was very juicy and tender, and looking at Crow, asked why he eats so little. She reiterated that it was delicious, and Kuro admitted that he wanted to relax, but they were still on a mission. He didn't argue with the fact that it was really tasty, but Rofia suddenly added that the food was much tastier because she was eating it with her beloved person. Kuro, looking at the enthusiastic expression on Rofia's face, asked if she was listening to him at all. Rofia said that she understood everything and asked Kuro to eat. Kuro agreed, but asked if they had ordered too many dishes. On the table next to them were oyster rice, Caesar salad with chicken and avocado, stewed broccoli with asparagus and turtle miso soup. Rofia said Kuro would need a lot of strength. After lunch, someone noted that they were only here to investigate for a few days, and Kuro added that they didn't have much information. He admitted that today he would like to walk through the disadvantaged district, asking Rofia if they managed to find anything. Rofia replied that her sister walked around the city, saying that there are a lot of barkers and other rabble here, but in general, it is an ordinary city. Kuro was again being watched by the girl who had done this earlier, but no one noticed her. Kuro agreed with Rofia's words and, looking at the street in front of him, noted that at first glance it was an ordinary city. Together with Rofia, he went further, admitting that he was sure that sooner or later they would find something. Kuro suddenly suggested that a clue might appear right now, and at that moment a girl in a raincoat crashed into him. Meanwhile, Arisha, holding out the earrings that were lying on her palm, said that she was buying these earrings worth 19,000 coins for 5,000. The seller was very surprised and refused Arisha's price, noting that she also needed to live on something. She said that she would sell it for at least 15,000, and Arisha asked, What about 7,000? After some deliberation, the seller agreed to 12,000, but Arisha was not going to give up and offered to buy earrings for 8,000. The seller reduced the price to 11,000, and Arisha tried to negotiate for 9,000. Finally, the seller gave Arish the packaged earrings, announcing that they had sold for 10,000 and thanking her for the purchase. Arisha noted that the quality of the magic stone was ordinary, but admitted that she liked the design, since it was clear that it was made by a master. The saleswoman asked in surprise, had Arisha really noticed this? She realized that Arisha was good at this, and admitted that she was sure that these earrings would look great on her small breasts. Arisha agreed at first, but after that, realizing what the saleswoman said, she asked again. The saleswoman shrugged and confirmed the words and words, explaining that these were nipple earrings. Arisha was embarrassed, thinking that the earrings she bought should look good, and asked if he would like it. Meanwhile, Furu was in a gambling establishment. She changed into an employee's costume, wearing, in addition, a headband with hair ears, looked at the cards of the player who laid out the king of spades, and asked if he was raising the bet. One of the men said he was upping the ante, admitting that he rarely sees dealers here who aren't succubi. Looking at his cards, he asked how Firu ended up here. Closing her eyes, she said that she was just working part-time and asked what about the others. The rest of the players at the table refused to raise the bet, but Yumuruma, who was also taking part in the game, pushed a large number of her chips forward, exclaiming that she was betting everything and smiling sweetly. The man was surprised, and Firu asked if the man supported this bet. He exclaimed his support and threw four kings onto the table in front of him. However, Yumuruma had a royal flash, and she laid out the cards in front of her and jumped up joyfully, shouting that this was a victory. The man laid his head doomedly on the table, and Yumuruma smiled, winking at Furu, who was holding a playing card in her hands. 
At this time, Ruashura was in a place where lit candles were burning, and someone noted that they had not had adventure clients for a long time. The succubus assumed that they were very tired every day and asked why they came here. Eremaria, who was lying on a soft mattress, said that they want to turn back time and always be beautiful. Ruashira admitted that she wanted to relieve tension, and Rafia said that she wanted to improve the condition of her skin. They all lay with their eyes closed, and special cosmetic masks were applied to their faces. The succubi said they heard them. A little later, when the previous procedure was completed, Rafia said contentedly that she was relaxing. Aramaria, who had been touched by someone's hand on her back, said that it was very good and asked for more, and the succubi replied that they really had a lot of tension accumulated. Rafia noted that the body was very warm, and the succubi said that each of them knows how to make any person feel good. They promised that Rafia, Aramaria, and Ruashira would look at the world differently, and after that they asked where they would go next. Rafia said that they would have to return to work, and the succubi asked in surprise. The adventurer girls replied that they needed to find a Daben company, and the next moment, the succubus doing the procedure put blindfolds on their eyes. Ruashira asked in surprise, are they really covering their eyes? The succubi confirmed this, explaining that it was so they could relax, but the adventurers admitted that they were uneasy due to the fact that they could not see anything. The succubi asked them not to worry, saying that they were professionals and promising that they would be pleased until the very end. The succubus poured a special liquid on her hands and smiled, again repeating that they should not worry as they would take care of them. Behind the grinning succubus stood two more girls, one of whom was holding large forceps in her hands, and the other a huge syringe. At the same time, someone's scream was heard on the street where Kuro was, and Kuro called out to Rofia, who knocked the little succubus girl to the ground, putting the blade of a sword to her head. Rofia asked in a threatening tone, what was this girl going to do to Kuro? She looked furiously at the frightened girl, asking her what she was even thinking about. Rofia did not understand what the girl was going to do to Kuro and what evil she was up to. She often admired Kuro, inserting into her angry speech phrases about how he belonged to her, and also about how she loved him. Kuro eventually stopped her, reminding Rofia that they were in the city and asking her to hide the sword. Not noticing any reaction from Rafia, he recently asked if she could hear him. However, Rofia continued to stand, threatening the succubus girl with a sword, calling her names and ordering her to answer questions and start praying. Kuro realized that it was useless since she was completely ignoring him and decided to try something else. He called Rofia's sister and asked if she could hear him. Rofia immediately changed and, smiling, turned around, sweetly saying that she heard. Kuro noted that she changed her mood very quickly, and Rofia walked up to Kuro, standing behind him. The girl sat on her knees in front of them, and Crow admitted that he had a lot of questions for her. He noted that the girl passed by and gave him something. Reaching forward, he showed a small piece of paper, reminding him that the item was this note. Rofia was very surprised to see this, and asked if this girl was one of those succubi who targeted Kuro. The girl did not agree with this, and, stuttering, wanted to say something else, but suddenly the steel collar that was put on her neck shone dimly, and the girl coughed. Crow, noticing her torment, ran closer and asked worriedly what was wrong. He assumed that the girl was wounded, and, turning to Rofia, asked if she really did this to her. Rofia said in fear that she had not done anything to this girl, and the succubus replied that everything was fine, admitting that she was just hungry. She was breathing heavily and drool was running from her mouth down her chin. Leaning closer to Kuro, she added that he looked delicious and raised her hand, touching Kuro's lips with a finger. At that moment, Rofia ran closer to them, who, looking focused in front of her, waved her sword, asking if she was really stupid. Blood splashed, and the succubus girl looked in fear at Rofia, who, frowning, ordered not to touch Crow, shouting that she would not forgive this. It turned out that a female succubus appeared behind the girl, at whom Rofia's attack was directed. Two curved blades that served as a weapon for the succubus were broken into several parts, and the girl herself fell behind the bewildered girl, who continued to sit, looking ahead in fear. Turning around, the girl in the metal collar screamed, and Rofia noted the bloodlust of the opponents, announcing that they were surrounded by about 20 people. More succubi came out of hiding, appearing on the streets and on the rooftops, and Rofia looked at them with concentration. Suddenly, Kuro reminded her that she shouldn't kill until they figured out the situation. 
Rofia first became sad, and then tried to be indignant, but Kuro told her not to make such a face. Rofia took a few steps forward and, taking out her sword, hit one of the succubi in the face with the hilt of it. The enemy flew away from the force of the blow, and Rofia promised that she would not kill. She used the sky cutter and used this skill to injure several more armed succubi. She asked Kuro to be calm because she would not kill any of them, and at that moment several girls approached Kuro. Kuro, thoughtfully holding his chin with his hand, looked appraisingly at the succubi, and after that, turning his gaze to the little girl standing next to him, he asked if these were her comrades. The girl shook her head, rejecting this assumption, and Kuro froze for a moment, focusing on the metal collar that was placed around the girl's neck. He called out to Rofia, and she, stopping the battle, turned in surprise at Crow, noticing how he, picking up the succubus girl in his arms, said that they were leaving here because they needed to sort it out. Rofia indignantly asked why Kuro was carrying this girl in his arms like a princess. She gritted her teeth and looked a little disappointed at Kuro, and he tried to somehow justify himself, but did not have time to say anything, since the succubi who attacked them intended to prevent him from leaving. They all started attacking at the same time, and Kuro and Rofia ran. Without stopping and continuing to hold the succubus girl in his arms, Kuro extended one of his hands forward and activated the creation skill. Turning around, he used the flame of the magical sword he created and directed the fire towards the succubi approaching them. One of the girls, frowning, looked at the fire surrounding them and asked in shock, was it really a black flame? The wall of fire stopped the succubi from continuing their pursuit, and when the flames finally cleared, the girls realized that Kuro, Rofia, and the little girl were gone. Kuro and the others, meanwhile, were running across the roofs of the city, and Rofia indignantly asked why Kuro was dragging this girl with him. Kuro said that they should not contact the others, and Rofia asked again in confusion. Kuro assumed that their guild would be divided on what to do with this girl, and, noticing Rofia's lack of understanding, explained that there was a collar of sin around the girl's neck. It was an item designed to control rebels and criminals, and the collar seemed to wrap an invisible spiked band around the heart of the person wearing it, causing pain. Crow said that the girl was suffering, but not from hunger, since the collar worked because she gave him a note. In that note, the girl promised that she would tell Kuro the whole truth and ask them to save the succubus. A little later, in the forest outside the succubus country, Kuro was sitting on a large rock, and a succubus girl was sitting on the ground next to him. She held Kuro's hand with her palms and licked the blood flowing from his finger. Finally, when a little more time had passed, Kuro removed his finger and asked if she had enough blood. The girl confirmed this and, smiling, admitted that she felt better and thanked Kuro. Rofia approached the girl, watching her warily, and Kuro asked her to be calm. The girl said that she was a succubus and her name was Huey, noting that, as they had already guessed, she was wearing a collar of sin. She explained that that's why she couldn't talk about everything, but she didn't even have time to finish that sentence because she started coughing again. Kuro, putting his palms forward, hurriedly said that there was nothing wrong with this, since he did not need details. He asked Huey to simply tell him what the current situation in the country was. Huey agreed and said that there has been a drought in the slums for several years, so there are many people dying of hunger every day, and only the center is growing and developing. She also noted that high taxes burden the already difficult lives of poor people, and therefore there is no chance to get out of poverty, as debts only grow. Huey added that there was something else, but didn't continue, so Kuro asked, what else? Huey trembled and cried, and Kuro suggested that succubi had appeared and were attacking people. Huey did not answer anything to this, trying to calm down, and Rofia, looking at Crow, asked if this had something to do with the disappearance of the Devon. Kuro noted in bewilderment that Huey had burst into tears, but suggested out loud that Rofia's question could be answered in the affirmative. He also added that those girls who attacked them may be among the succubi who attack people. Rofia, crossing her arms over her chest, said thoughtfully that this could be some kind of organization that is hiding their crimes, and Huey, clenching the fabric of her dress in her fists, desperately said that this cannot go on forever, because when they find out about everything, they will kill everyone. Huey began to cry again, and Kuro sat down on one knee next to her and, placing his palms on Huey's hands, promised that he would help her. Huey looked at Crow in surprise, and Rofia shouted his name indignantly. Kuro did not pay attention to Rofia's cry, admitting that he was not sure that he could fix everything, 
but said that he was going to solve everything as peacefully as possible and smiled confidently. At the same time, someone indignantly asked what Huey was thinking about. This person was outraged that she began to communicate with a human adventurer, but the succubus girl asked to be calmer, noting that this city was their land, and soon there would also be reinforcements, so they would find them without any problems. One of the succubus girls exclaimed that they should punish Huey, because the queen was favorable to her, and she behaved this way. Suddenly, someone's scream was heard, and the succubi, turning around, saw the wounded body of the succubus girl, and asked what it was. They saw several people approaching them, who asked if they should come here. It was Arisha, Furu and Yumaruma, who were looking at the succubi in front of them with anger. Arisha said that she felt that Kuro was with them, and Furu said that in that case, the reason they couldn't contact Kuro had something to do with them. Yumuruma threateningly noted that she would not forgive this, and one of the succubi realized that these were people, assuming that they were the comrades of that adventurer. Yumuruma told them to give Crow to them. The succubi grinned and asked what she was talking about. Yumuruma took off the backpack that she had been carrying with her before, and then took out a huge axe and activated the Karunos. Swinging her weapon, she jumped up and hit the ground with her axe, causing the asphalt to crack and lightning bolts to fly in different directions. One of the succubi looked in horror at the fragments of stone flying into the air, as well as at her comrades, who lay unconscious on the ground, affected by Yumaruma's attack. Looking up, Yumaruma began to cry, desperately exclaiming that she would never see Crow again, and the succubus asked what kind of nonsense was this. Another succubus girl exclaimed in bewilderment that Yumaruma was a child, and Arisha, meanwhile, asked Yumaruma not to cry, advising her to kill instead. Furu joined the palms of both hands, admitting that she really wanted to avoid this, but added that they had harmed Kuro, which meant there was no choice, and threateningly noted that this was a declaration of war. At this point, Crow promised Huey that he would help her people. A little later, Yumuruma, in the time freed up for rest, slept with her head on the lap of Furu, who was sitting next to her. Screams were heard very close by, because Arisha, putting out her hand with a staff, was tormenting the succubi in the fire, screaming in pain. However, Furu and Arisha simply looked on indifferently, while Yumaruma slept peacefully. The succubi continued to scream, but Arisha did not turn off the fire, explaining that Crow had made this staff for her, and the power of this flame was capable of covering an entire street here. One of the succubi, stuttering, said that she was in pain and asked to kill her. Furu rose to her feet and asked why kill her. She noted that the succubus never told them where Kuro was. Arisha turned off the fire, and the girl, falling to the ground, exclaimed that she did not say because she did not know, since he had run away. Fura crossed her arms, looking at the succubus, and asked why they couldn't find Kuro then. The succubus could not answer, but Furu took out a small knife and, twirling it in her fingers, ordered the girl to answer, why is it not there? Leaning over the succubus, she put the tip of the knife blade to her eye and seriously asked if the succubus really wanted to say that he was avoiding them. The girl exclaimed that she did not know this, and at that moment Yumuruma woke up and stood up yawning. Arisha wished her good morning and, hugging Yumuruma, stroked her head, and after that, turning to fewer, she said that she could no longer suffer from the succubus. Looking at the bodies lying nearby, she remembered that the others had also said this, suggesting that it was most likely true. Yumaruma realized that Kuro was safe and happily exclaimed that this was good. Furu agreed that this was good and suggested changing the question and asking about the Devon Company. Sweat and tears streamed down the succubus's face, but she didn't say anything when Furu told her about the company. Without waiting for words from the girl, Furu turned her over on her stomach and pressed her to the ground, raising the succubus hand upside down. She noted that the succubus knew something about this, but the girl desperately shouted that she did not know. She wanted to say what would happen even if she knew, but Furu and the others told her not to worry, noting that they wouldn't mind if she didn't talk, because her muscles, eyes, and heartbeat wouldn't lie. Furu turned to Arisha, and she, taking out a small notebook, said that they had struck several places in the city, and even dug up those places that they were hiding in plain sight. The succubus looked at them in horror as Arisha began to list places such as the ruins of the succubus temple, the suburban hospital, the warehouse district, the succubus hotel, the TSM underground facility. The succubus's hand, whose wrist clasped Furu, twitched a little, and Furu looked seriously at the girl, tears of horror flowing from her eyes. Furu stood up, and the succubus screamed in pain. 
Ignoring her screams, Furu touched the earring and, turning to Rurashira, asked if she could hear her. Rurashira, also touching the same earring on her ear, said that she was listening, and Furu announced that they knew the location of the Devon. Hearing what Furu told her, Rurashira asked if it was really underground. She promised that they would leave immediately. Throughout the conversation, Rurashira stood completely pointing a gun at the succubus lying in front of her. Arimaria and Rafia also stood nearby, holding the other succubi nearby with their weapons. A little later in the forest, Rofia indignantly asked why Kuro always does this. She capriciously hit him on the shoulder several times and exclaimed that succubi did not need to be saved. Kuro asked in bewilderment if she was jealous. Rofia exclaimed that they were attacked by these same succubi and added that he did not know whether Huey was telling the truth. She desperately noted that succubi learn about morality from adult books, and Kuro, hearing this, reproachfully said that this was already racism. However, Huey, smiling, admitted that they really study from such books, and Kuro decided to change the topic, admitting that he thought that he and Rofia could do this. Taking his chin with his hand, he asked, Is it really impossible? Rofia looked at him confusedly and asked if they could really do this just the two of them. She said with excitement that her heart was fluttering, but Kuro added that Huey would also be with them. However, Rofia did not pay any attention to these words, and, coming closer to Kuro, hugged him. Crow realized that Huey wanted them to convince the queen, and hoped that they could save the people who were being held captive. Huey confirmed this, but sadly noted that if she goes against the queen, something terrible will happen. Kuro, smiling, asked her not to worry, promising that he would figure out what to do with her collar. Huey looked at Kuro in surprise and embarrassment. At this time, in the land of Succubi, somewhere underground, cracks appeared on the wall, which became increasingly larger, and the next moment there was an explosion, and the wall scattered to the sides with small fragments of stones. Smoke was coming from the long device, and someone said that after three direct hits the wall was no longer there. Aramaria was wondering where Crow had gone. Rafia, standing next to her, suggested that he was fine, and Rurashira, who was standing a little ahead, noted that Crow might now be close to the truth, and therefore suggested that they hurry up. The three of them walked through the hole that had formed instead of the wall and headed further down the corridor. Rurashira covered her nose with her hand, noting that the smell in here was very unpleasant. The smell came from the depths of the dark corridor, and Aramaria asked if such a smell really occurs when succubi take away all living things from people. Rafia asked Aramaria to speak more softly, and Rurashira said that the smell was truly disgusting. They walked a little further and finally noticed a dungeon, fenced with steel bars into which maddened men clung. Rurashira looked in bewilderment at the men, who shouted that they smelled the scent of women and asked to help them, noting that their whole body was burning and they could not stand it any longer. Rafia and Aramaria were stunned to see all this, and the men, stretching out their hands to them through the gaps between the bars, continued to scream. Suddenly, the clink of a chain was heard, and someone asked if they really liked looking at lost men so much. Turning around, Rurashira, Rafia, and Aramaria noticed a succubus girl, next to whom a man was kneeling, chained with a steel collar. The girl tightened her grip on the free end of the chain in her hand and, smiling, thanked the mercenaries for their good work, happily noting that they had found them. Rafia sadly noted that these were men from the Devon Company and asked if they really used them as food. The girl confirmed this, explaining that they increased the desire of these men so that they could satisfy them. She replied that some of them were even happy about this outcome, but added that the weight had become something unbearable for them. Rafia, Aramaria, and Rurashira looked at the succubus, and she, taking out a knife, decided that it was time to get to work. The succubus pressed the blade against the neck of the man, whom she pulled closer to her by yanking on the chain. She said if Rurashira, Rafia, and Aramaria move even one step, she will cut this man's throat and stuck out her tongue, listening to the man's pleas for salvation. He exclaimed that Rurashira and the others had come to save him and asked them to stop the succubus from killing him. Grinning, the succubus added that the man was also wearing a cursed collar, and asked that Aramaria and Rurashira be good girls. Rurashira took out a pistol and asked why the succubus decided that they needed him alive. The succubus screamed in surprise, and Rurashira calmly shot the man. The succubus girl screamed, not expecting such an outcome of events. She asked in amazement why they did this. The succubus noted that he was a human, 
and Ruroshira said that it was because with hostages everything was much more complicated. After this, Ruroshira called out to Aramaria and Rafia standing behind her, and the succubus girl fell to her knees, watching as Rafia and Aramaria, cutting the iron bars of the dungeon, killed the men inside. The succubus sat with her eyes wide open in horror, and looking at the three distraught girls of the adventurers who were killing, not paying attention to the splashes of blood, she asked if they were really people. Ruroshira, smiling terribly, asked again, and then said that they are simply ready to do anything for the sake of the person they love. The succubus fearfully repeated her words, and Ruroshira and the others explained that Crow is a kind person who wants to help everyone, no matter what condition these people are in, and no matter what terrible problem they find themselves in. The three of them pictured a smiling Kuro surrounded by a bright light, and Ruroshira said that he didn't need to take on so much, noting that that was why she would proactively eliminate those who would give him trouble, since they all loved Kuro. Ruashira looked truly terrifying when she smiled, despite the fact that her skin and clothes were stained with blood. The succubus, shaking in horror, ran away and Aramaria, noticing this, said that the girl had run away. Ruashira told Aramaria to go in pursuit, and Aramaria, agreeing with this, immediately began to do what Ruashira asked her to do. Ruashira suddenly heard someone calling out to her, and turned around to see Rafia, who indifferently said that there was another living person here, holding a man by the hair who was trying to escape. Rafia abandoned him and stood next to Ruashira, and the man asked who they were. He didn't understand why they were doing this, and assumed that the girls were working together with Succubi. Ruashira, closing her eyes, calmly said that she was not an ally of the Succubi, but admitted that more than anything she hated people. The man asked again in bewilderment, and Ruroshira inserted the barrel of the gun into his mouth, announcing that she had a question. The man looked at Ruroshira in horror, and she asked if it was true that he was from Devon. Looking seriously at the man, she asked what they were doing in this city. At this time, the succubus girl, breathing heavily, ran along the corridor, and approaching the high double doors, ran into the huge hall and, turning to the queen, desperately shouted that nothing had worked out for her. She looked at the girl sitting on the throne at the far end of the room, and, standing among the guards guarding the passage, noted that they were simply crazy. The succubus sweated with fear, and said that something terrible would happen if nothing was done. She was ordered to calm down, and Yarma, looking calmly at the girl, asked if she had really met the enemy and led them here. The succubus screamed in fear, and then said that she was walking through the labyrinth so they could not pursue her. However, Ayarama, making a dissatisfied sound, said that the girl brought them here. At that moment, a loud sound came from behind the doors, and dust seeped into the hall through a narrow gap in the door. The succubus looked at this in surprise, and Aramaria, opening the door, said that she had found them. Yarma continued to sit calmly on her heart-shaped throne, and the succubus girl screamed in fear when she heard Aramaria say that they were caught. Some time later, Kuro, Rofia, and Huey were walking down the corridor. Hearing some screams in the distance, Rofia was glad to realize that they were on the right path. Huey asked in fear, what is this scream? She noted that it also felt like the ground was shaking and asked what was going on here. Rofia thought for a moment and assumed that these were the sounds of genocide, and Kuro realized that they were too late. Rofia and Huey said his name in surprise, and Kuro decided that in any case he had to hurry, because it might not be too late. Huey and Rofia agreed, and the three of them entered the huge hall, seeing Aramaria lifting the succubus into the air, squeezing her throat. Crow called out to Aramaria, and she, changing the murderous expression on her face to a sweet smile, released the trembling succubus and, turning around, said that Crow was here. Running closer, she asked if he was injured. Aramaria asked if Kuro was okay. Crow replied that everything was fine, and Aramaria was very happy to hear this, and asked if they really didn't do anything to him. Kuro repeated that everything was fine, and Aramaria exclaimed that these lustful demons were simply terrible. She noted that they didn't even know where Kuro was, and didn't want to listen to them. Kuro asked again in surprise, and the succubus, who came closer to them, seriously said that they had nothing to talk to them about. It was Yarama, who, crossing her arms over her chest, frowned and said that she already understood their goal calling the adventurers the faithful assistants of Viscount Rai. Looking at Iharam, Crow assumed that she was the queen and said that there had been some kind of misunderstanding. He explained that they just wanted to free the people and make peace with them, and Aramaria, hearing this, froze in bewilderment. 
Kuro, noticing her reaction, asked what it was. Yarma, coming closer, repeated Crow's words about liberation and application, and asked if he was really saying something about misunderstanding. She noted that they, succubi, feed on the energy of people, and in return give them pleasure. Yarma said that there is nothing better in this world than having fun with a succubus. Grinning, she asked if Kuro wanted to make sure of this. Several succubi, having risen, began to run towards Crow, stretching out their hands to him, but they did not have time to approach, as something suddenly flashed quickly right in front of them. It was Aramaria and Rofia, who, waving their weapons, threw the succubi back. The force of their blows was so great that the succubi, hitting the wall, formed a deep dent in it, and Yarama, noticing this, frowned with displeasure. Rofia, tilting her head slightly to the side, asked what they were trying to do with Kuro now. She admitted that she didn't understand them at all, and asked if they were really tired of living. Aramaria, preparing for further battle, called the succubi pathetic insects and, noting that they were trying to get closer to Kuro, said that they deserved only death. Crow suggested that the succubi surrender, noting that they did not believe them, but were only complicating the situation. He did not have time to continue speaking as his words were suddenly interrupted by Huey, who turned to Yarma. She asked Yarma to stop, noting that they couldn't hide this forever. Yarma, frowning, said that Huey had simply betrayed them, and Huey asked that Yarma confess everything and free the captives, because if she showed sincerity, people would forgive them. Yarma thought about it, and finally said that Huey was right about one thing, namely, that it really wouldn't be possible to hide forever. Huey suggested that the queen agreed to cooperate, but Yarma suddenly said that she was not as stupid as Huey. Huey looked at the serious Yarma with horror, and Yarma exclaimed that people do not need the sincerity of succubi, and succubi do not need forgiveness from people, because if everything remains like this, then nothing will change in this city, and hunger will return again. She asked if Huey really thought people would forgive them. She furiously said that people do not know forgiveness, so they will simply make slaves out of succubi. Yarma imagined how molten wax would be poured on the bodies of the succubi, as well as beating the succubi with a whip, and asked whether Huey was really ready to watch her comrades experience such humiliation. She called all the people names, noting that they only want to exploit them. Yarma seriously asked that Huey not tell her that these people had managed to deceive her. Huey asked in fear, had she really been deceived? Blood suddenly gushed from her mouth, and Yarma, noticing this, said that the curse of the collar had begun to take effect. Huey frightenedly grabbed the steel surface of the collar with her hands, and Yarma announced that she would soon die and no one could do anything about it. Tears appeared in Huey's eyes, and she said in bewilderment that Kuro had lifted the curse. Kuro looked at her in surprise, and replied that he had not lifted any curse. Huey froze for a moment, and then, running up to Kuro, she desperately exclaimed that he had told her about this then. Kuro remembered that he actually said something like that, and Huey recalled that he promised that he would help her. Kuro did not argue with the fact that it was, and Huey asked incomprehensibly why he was doing this. Someone suddenly asked, is Huey really stupid and doesn't understand anything? Huey, turning around, said in surprise the name of Nitya, who was sitting leaning against the wall and gritting her teeth in pain. Nitya exclaimed that Kuro had planned to kill Huey from the very beginning and place all the blame on her. She added that then, having killed her, he would have announced that he had settled the conflict, and then would have agreed with the queen. Huey listened to these words, crying, and then looked at Kuro, who, having confirmed all this, admitted that he was now considering exactly this option. He explained that he looked at the situation in the city and thought that this was an appropriate solution, noting that they would calmly return to the guild. Huey cried even more, and Kuro said that she would give her life in the name of a higher goal. Huey opened her eyes wide in horror and, saying that this could not be, admitted that she did not want to die. Aramaria and Rofia watched this indifferently. The succubi looked at Huey with regret, and the queen, looking at her, did not show any emotion. Tears of despair flowed down Huey's cheeks, and in the next second, the curse of the collar worked completely, and it exploded, causing Huey's to fly to the side. Huey managed to ask why Crow did this. After that, bounced off the floor and rolled to Iharam's feet.